The Dave Hooker Show, represented by Banks and Jones, Tennessee's trial attorneys. Play to win, banksjones.com. The Dave Hooker Show. A presentation of Off the Hook Sports. Objective insight, expertise, top guest. Available on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, and the Off the Hook Sports app. Download now for free. Also available on offthehooksports.com. I compute and obey. Now to Dave Hooker. Ready. All right, here we go. Tennessee in the Sweet 16. We enjoyed visiting with you after the game on Saturday to talk about that. But now that we're in a more regular routine, let's attack the balls being in the Sweet 16. Not the best tournament that I have seen, but only the 10th time that Tennessee makes it to the Sweet 16. So in about 100 years of basketball, that's pretty darn impressive. Does this make Rick Barnes the greatest coach ever at Tennessee? We'll take a look ahead to Creighton. You can check that out on offthehooksports.com. And the SEC has been absolutely brutal. Is this an embarrassment for Greg Sankey? And then Trevor Etienne. Uh, ATN, I should say, gets DUI, another Georgia traffic incident. In case you're wondering, he was the former Florida tailback who went to Georgia. How big of a problem is this? It's big, guys, and we're going to get into it. And it doesn't just affect Georgia. It's going to affect more schools than that. And Tennessee might be one of them because these guys are in another realm than they ever were of buying cars that are way too fast for an 18-year-old. With Caleb Calhoun, I'm Dave Hooker. Go ahead and hit that like and subscribe button. We greatly appreciate that. Caleb, how are you, sir? Dave, I am amazing. I am. I know. I know. We get up early to get our show, but I kind of enjoy the late night games. And you know, we got a few more to cover this week. Tennessee's playing at like what is it nine something on Thursday on Friday? You said what? I'm sorry. I said. We got more late night games coming because I think Tennessee's playing at like nine something on Friday. I don't know exact, the exact time when they tip off or on Friday, but it's another late night game for Tennessee now, basketball. I, I agree. I agree. I want to go ahead and get to today's tough question right now. And that's brought to you in part by our friends at the Hemp House. Today's tough question right now. Today's tough question. Take a side. Take a stand. The Dave Hooker Show, a presentation of offthehooksports.com. Today's tough question is this. How would you describe Tennessee in the Sweet 16? So I've got a couple of options for you. I'll throw them at you right now. It's celebrate. It's expected. It is lowest possible rung. In other words, this is what you absolutely have to do each and every year. So how would you describe Tennessee in the Sweet 16? Actually, I'll just do this. Celebrate expected mandatory. There was a time in the women's game where it was pretty mandatory to make it to the Sweet 16 if you're a good coach at all. That's never been that case uh, in the men's game, but let's dive into it right now. Caleb, how would you answer that question? It is on the YouTube page. Go ahead and vote now, and we'll get you down. Caleb, how would you answer that given those three very specific answers? So expected, lowest of the wrong, and celebrate? I'm going expected. Oh. We're we're going we're going to make it a little easier than that. We're just going to make it ex, we're going to make it celebrate expected mandatory. Celebrate expected mandatory. Okay, I will go expected. I will go expected. I won't go mandatory because I will say that I don't think that that's like a base of what you expect for Tennessee basketball every year. I think the NCAA tournament's what you expect given this history. But I will go expected, which is to say that given this team, given what we saw them do all year long, given the unique nature of Dalton Connect. I think it was perfectly fair to say that um, to expect them to make the Sweet 16. So the fact that they did is a very good sign for them, and and they did. 
I'm going to go mandatory because what I've seen this year, it is not just Tennessee as a basketball program, but it's what I have seen this year from the Vols. And I believe that it was mandatory that they get to at least the Sweet 16. If not, and I know we don't want to judge coaches off one game, but if they had fallen short against St. Peter's, who I think tallest player is about five foot seven, or Texas, who was just horrendous. Uh, and Tennessee played well. I'm not knocking the way Tennessee played, but Texas didn't play well, and Tennessee missed a bunch of shots. To me, that's mandatory. Given what I know now, it is mandatory to be there. Given what Tennessee has, the way Dalton Connect improved throughout the season, and the fact that you had two teams that you outmatched, it's mandatory for me. You had to get there at this point. It's revisionist history because I've seen those teams, and I know what Dalton Connect is, but Nothing else would have been acceptable. Brought to you by the Hemp House, the premier hemp dispensary online with a wide variety, great selection, and strict standards to ensure you only receive the best in CBD or Delta products. Go to Hemp House Chat with 2Ts.com. Hemp House Chat with 2Ts.com. Use the promo code HOOKED. That's HOOKED for 10% off. Caleb, did I do anything in that last soliloquy that might make you change your mind just a little bit because I am getting some mandatory votes. Nah, nah, it's, I still go expect it. Um, I understand your mandatory point, but look, this is like a, a game like Texas is the type of game Tennessee always loses under Rick Barnes in the NCAA tournament. So I can't sit there and say that, oh, this is to be expected. We've thought they've had different teams in the past. We have said this team is truly different. You've been saying this for a while, but I would argue that it still was, I would only go expected. Now, some might say we're splitting hairs between expected and mandatory. Is that fair to say? No, because expected, I, I can say I expect you to do this task by 10 o'clock at night, whereas if, you, if it's 11, 12 at night or the next day, I mean, that's, that's understandable uh, as long as there's a decent excuse and you've got a good history of work ethic. But mandatory is when somebody uses the word mandatory, you're a little bit on the hot seat if you don't come through. Yeah, OK, that's fair enough to say. Um, I would still have gone expected. I wouldn't have Rick Barnes on the hot seat right now, even if he had not gone to the Sweet 16, because I think you have to know what Tennessee basketball is as a program. And we talk about Danny White, you know, in the past, settling on women's basketball. Well, the expectations are different depending on the sport. Tennessee, bat and ends, getting into the NCAA tournament every year, that's, or, or just being a perennial NCAA tournament team, that's the goal of Tennessee basketball. And that's what they are. And the truth of the matter is, I mean, I, I did more digging. I can't say for sure. Now, I do think there's a pattern in why Rick Barnes may have had, may have had some flame outs before this year. But, I mean, he did make three lead eights in a Final Four from 2003 to 2008. So then I went back and I started to think maybe maybe it's just luck of the draw a lot of times. Maybe it's just roll of the dice and who goes far in the NCAA tournament. I mean, Mark Few has no national titles. Tony Bennett at Virginia has won. I would take Mark Few coaching in the NCAA tournament every day over Tony Bennett. I just don't think Mark Few's been as lucky as Tony Bennett in that situation. So... I think Tennessee's gotten some bad draws. I wouldn't argue with you there. I also wonder if it's a self-fulfilling prophecy where the NCAA selection committee says, ah, well, you know that Rick Barnes guy, we gave him a good seat at Texas a couple of times and he burned us, didn't go deep. So why should we bend over backwards to help him with a seating or a draw against Ooh, another team. That is, you, like you that? think the NCAA tournament seeds teams based on who they think will put on a good show in the sweet 16. You think they look that far ahead? I think it's human nature not to say, say that that group let us down. That group seems to do something special every year. So if there's a harder path in there, I think it's natural. You say, let's put the team that hasn't choked previously in that spot. That is very interesting, Dave. Especially when you're very. talking about the same coaches, not the same programs. Because you know, Dean Smith went forever without uh, winning, what, his second championship or went forever without it winning his first. I can't remember. But I'm talking about coaches. So I'm not I'm not necessarily talking about 
just the programs because the programs can change from time to time, Caleb. Right, right. No, I get what you're saying. That's still very interesting. Are you? So uh, you're in on this. You're down. Now I'm thinking way out ahead. Like maybe the select. I, I, because I've always wondered if the selection committee is just lazy in how they throw the brackets together. A lot of it doesn't reflect the actual body of work, and a lot of it definitely doesn't reflect the conference tournaments. But then I go back and I look. What if they're seeding based on who they think is most likely to give them the best matchups in the Sweet 16 and the Elite Eight? Because they know the first two rounds, you're going to get the match. You're everybody's going to watch anyway. The first two rounds. That's just how March Madness works. Once the Sweet 16 comes, you want the matchups that people are going to want to see. A lot of times, you do. And if you're gambling on those matchups, we know how to do it. Because if you go to Bet US, you've got the 125 percent bonus on your first three deposits plus your 10 percent gambler's insurance bet us click right below to get that incredible deal thanks to off the hook sports america's favorite sports book and casino live betting and race book we're celebrating 30 years with a historic offer a 125 percent sign-up bonus on your first three deposits plus 10 percent gambler's insurance get started today bet us where the game begins all right, so my guy Caleb Calhoun has an interesting take. It's pretty strong when you first hear it, and then you say to yourself, well, I don't know, maybe not. Maybe that is uh, that is a good, a good take by Caleb. He's been a little bit ahead of the curve. But as far as Tennessee and the way this should be accepted – I'll ask you this in today's tough question, which is on the YouTube page. You can vote on it right now. Hit the like and subscribe button. Celebrate expected or mandatory. So I'll take mandatory off the list. Let's pretend Tennessee wins and gets to the Elite Eight. Is that celebrate or expected? Knowing what you know about this program, but also knowing what you know about these players and what they've done this year. Relative to going into the season, I would say celebrate. But relative to what we learned about this program in January, at that point, it's expected. Because I will say this team was more NCAA tournament cut out than any team I've ever seen Rick Barnes coach. I can't ignore that fact. And so given that, it goes from celebrated, I mean, to it goes from celebrated to expected. But maybe that's unfair to Rick Barnes because like this is like, Okay, so because you exceed expectations in one way, now there are new expectations placed on you, and then you fail because you didn't meet those expectations, even though those weren't the original expectations. Well, I mean, this is I'm, the, not, I'm not. Tr- I'm not trying to pretend that we're saying Tennessee's athletic department feels this way. They're happy. They're not going to make any sort of goofy move. I mean, so I, I mean, I think they're very happy. But I would say Elite Eight is to be expected based off what I've seen with this team if rick barnes did not make it to the elite eight with this group that would be and could still be disappointing so i guess tennessee within the context of the season is like clemson football under Dabo swinney they shouldn't be mad at Dabo because they never expected this type of success but i guess they can still call it a disappointment if they're not in the college football playoff now given what they're where they're at as a program yep that's that's fair i can roll with that and it is time for what the H because Caleb is throwing heat when it comes to Rick Barnes. What the? What was he thinking? Release the hounds. The Dave Hooker Show. Keep cool. A presentation of offthehooksports.com. According to Caleb Calhoun on offthehooksports.com, Rick Barnes is one win away from becoming the greatest coach in Tennessee history. My first retort is Caleb Bruce Pearl got to an elite eight. You have to have a deeper run to be considered a better coach. Also, Bruce Pearl took over at a a time where the program needed to be built up. So there's something innate there. I don't know how much you count that, but that's on my plate. So convince me with a, a, a similar record at, Tennessee making the elite eight just once if that's how it plays out you would take Barnes over Pearl because my initial response you may change my mind here give it a shot is I would take Pearl over Barnes if Barnes makes the elite eight this year 
Give me an accomplishment Bruce Pearl at Tennessee had that Rick Barnes hasn't had. Well, I mean, he uh, girlfriend. <laughs> Bruce right, Pearl. He did all right there. He did pretty well there. Bruce Pearl. Al High alum. Bruce Pearl. Oh my gosh. Bruce Pearl had the um, most impressive six year run in Tennessee basketball history. I won't take that away. And he was only coached for six years. But, you know, coaching is a body of work and longevity. And I get, let, let me, let's back up for a minute. Bruce Pearl. What did he do at Tennessee? He gave them their first 30 win season, their first number one ranking, their first outright SEC title in 30 years, and took them to an Elite Eight and made three Sweet 16s. Rick Barnes got them their second number one ranking, their second 30 win season. He had them at number one for three weeks. Bruce Pearl only had them at number one for a week. And he's won an SEC regular season title now. He's made three, six, three Sweet 16s. And he actually won an SEC tournament title, which Bruce Pearl never won. And you're telling me if he makes it to the Elite Eight and gets bounced out that you're splitting hairs to some extent. I mean, he is officially the most accomplished head coach in Tennessee basketball history. And I'm going to push back on you and what Bruce Pearl versus Rick Barnes inherited. I think. Well, they were both bad. I thought you might call me out on that one. Well, Rick Bar Yes, but look, Bruce Pearl. Because Tubby Smith didn't know how to evaluate talent, did take over where Chris Lofton fell out of the sky into his lap. And he also took over where CJ Watson, whose family was in Nas was from Tennessee, wasn't even trying to be recruited, was committed to Tennessee and was a senior too. And he also did have Major Wingate, a four-star center down low. So Bruce Pearl took over and had talent on the roster. Mm -hmm. but didn't recruit well, but he did at least have some decent players. Again, Buzz got lucky. The, I'm naming Major Wingate, CJ Watson. Let's call it what it is, Dave. No, it's Chris Lawson. Chris Lawson fell out of the sky into Bruce Pearl's lap. Is that fair to say? Yeah, he was pretty good. Kind of like a mini me version of Steph Curry. He's got poor man's Steph Curry. Don Self, State Farm, customer service matters with Don Self, and they're right there in the Chattanooga area. Go to donself.net, donself.net. If you're not in his area, then he'll help you find the State Farm agent that can take care of you. They've been doing this thing for over 40 years. They kind of know what they're doing. It's Don Self. DonSelf.net. Customer service still matters. What about the fact that if not for Pearl having impromptu pep rallies in the cafeteria, if not for him painting his chest, Tennessee may still be fighting the battle of relevance and may not even get Rick Barnes because Bruce Pearl hadn't built up the program if you don't hire him. I think that is an important piece of the puzzle that is every bit as important as wins or loss. losses. It's just harder to quantify. I don't know. I think Tennessee was a desirable job, honestly, even before Bruce Pearl. I think that um, they bungled their coaching searches because they weren't really willing to work hard to hire coaches, as you know, Dave. I mean, but it's not like they couldn't have gotten certain coaches in the past. I do believe they could have gotten Bill Self at one point when they were looking for a coach back in 97 um, when they landed on Jerry Green. Don't quote me on that, but there is a coach they were looking for that I thought was pretty good during that time. And, and I, they hired Jerry Green? Yeah, when they stumbled, when they hired Jerry Green, who wasn't there. Are you thinking of Gene Stallings? No, that was when they hired Buds Buzz Peterson, wasn't it? Not Gene no. Stallings. You're thinking of you're thinking of um no, not Gene Jim Stallings. Stallings. No, the but, guy at Stallings, the bald guy who Kevin Stallings. Yeah, Kevin Stallings. Kevin Stallings. They were gonna hire Kevin Stallings, and uh Doug Dickey went to take a phone call from Jerry Green's agent in the other room, and Kevin Stallings' wife uh, eavesdropped on the call and told uh Tennessee's contingent that they could get the bleep out of their living room if they're going to be taking calls from other candidates the new sentinel actually ran kevin stallings up on the front as tennessee's next basketball coach that's how it melted down so quick just poof so that may okay. be who you're thinking of sorry to get sidetracked yes. but that's no, a good right. story you got to admit that that's a heck of a story and by the way kevin stallings now this is what helped with bruce pearl you got to remember who did tennessee have they had kevin o'neill who was just all defense grinded out win 30 to 29 they tried to hire kevin stallings who was basically kevin o'neill in that way 
they hired Buzz Peterson, who just and they hired Jerry Green, who just didn't bother to coach at all. They hired Buzz Peterson, who coached in the old Dean Smith, like not evolved at all from 1980s uh, style. So they were always coaching a boring brand. Do I think Rick Barnes could have created the fireworks Bruce Pearl created immediately? No. But do I think Rick Barnes was runs a more exciting brand of basketball than those coaches we just named? Yes. I mean, and so part of it was they were hiring coaches. They weren't just – the reason it looked so different with Bruce Pearl was relative to just how boring the styles were before Bruce Pearl. They were just unwatchable styles of basketball. Okay, I want to ask you this question, and I'm going to put it up as our new poll question. Who would you hire right now? There are times I ask the question because I want to know where people stand because I feel like I'm having trouble reading the room. There are other times I feel like I'm reading the room, but I want to see how well I'm reading the room. So I just put up on the YouTube page, and I would love your vote. Who would you hire right now? Bruce Pearl, Rick Barnes. Calhoun University is open for business. You have unlimited funds. You can go buy. You can go get any coach you want to. So who are you hiring, Bruce Pearl or Rick Barnes? Before you get to that answer, I want to tell you about our friends at Quality Tire Pro, downtown Chattanooga, the full-service automotive brake alignments, oil changes, and more since 1957. Stop by and say off the hook sports said, hey, Bo, hey, Bo, Cherokee Boulevard, or online at qualitytirepros.com. Caleb? It's Rick Barnes, and it's not even close. It's not even close. Now, Bruce Pearl is younger, right? I mean, yes, Bruce Pearl is younger, but at that age, age becomes more about who's healthier than the number. Okay, Bruce Pearl is six years younger. Who's healthier? Dave, gun to your head, who's going to live longer? That's more about who's living. I mean, longer. he looks six years older, but except for the face, you know. I mean, um, he looks six years older instead of six years under younger. He does. He does. He. I mean. People were saying that people were talking about, you know, all the jokes on Bruce Pearl painting his chest. Rick Barnes would look better painting his chest than Bruce Pearl did. I can just tell you that right now. Don't want to see any of them, though. (laughs) But it's Rick Barnes. One, I talked to my brother over the weekend and he actually had a great point that I didn't even think of. He said Bruce Pearl's one thing that he has over Rick Barnes. And it's what you bring up, kind of the cheerleader instinct, the mascot, which he was at Boston College. Bruce Pearl knows how to motivate players. Is that fair? He's the best motivator of talent that's ever coached a game. I would agree with that. That's... Yeah. In terms of actual development of talent and actual basketball tacticians, Rick Barnes might actually be better. No, overall. I don't. I don't. Uh, well, you threw tacticians at the very end. Developer of talent, I don't think there's any question that Rick Barnes is better. As far as a tactician, that's a little bit more difficult to compare the two. I would, I would, at the time that Bruce Pearl was at Tennessee, he was kind of ahead of the curve, right? On some different right. stuff that he was running. He's not really ahead of the curve. He's kind of like the Chip Kelly of college basketball. So at this point, I don't think you get that great advantage, but I also don't think that Rick Barnes does anything that's incredible. So I think it's I think it's Bruce Pearl also because of the age. And I know that he lost over the weekend and Tennessee won, but you would agree with me. This is not any sort of decision that you would make just based off one tournament. No, I would. I, I you notice I did not bring Auburn losing in the first round into this at all. You did not. I mean, and I never would. I think in general, Rick Barnes develops talent better. Bruce Pearl is ahead of the Bruce Pearl was ahead of the curve and he's still been able to adjust with teams catching up. You know, I make this joke, uh, Dave. Bruce Pearl at Tennessee was like Steve Spurrier at Florida. Bruce Pearl at Auburn was like Steve Spurrier at South Carolina. Where, yeah, you know, yeah, because now at Auburn, he's had to change up a little bit his style and what he's done. And he's still he's still been able to adjust. So I give him credit on that. But look at how Rick Barnes adjusted this year. Dave, he's always run a more centered flex offense. And he immediately, when he saw what he had in Dalton Connect, switched to a high-low motion offense, running what Bill Self runs at Kansas. Yep. And he's he's never run that before, ever. And he just switched on it overnight. I mean, that's impressive. And so do you so give I, okay, so when when you're writing up both of their resumes, 
Um, do you, you look at Bruce Pearl and you say, oh, he was a tactician ahead of the curve for a short amount of time, a few years? Or do you look at Rick Barnes and say he can do more than one thing, which is more valuable if you're looking for a coach? I'm going to go ahead and tell you I go to the latter. I'd still take Bruce Pearl as a whole, but I'll support your point with the latter. Yeah, it's it's the latter. And also because the I, I mean, we used to think it was Rick Barnes was a failed tactician because of the way he flames out of the NCAA tournament. I kind of went back and looked, and I do believe it has more to do with, and Jimmy Hyans has brought this up, it, it has more to do with just how Rick Barnes grinds the players too much. But that doesn't mean that he doesn't have an understanding of X's and O's as well as yes. anybody. He just probably over he, – he, he doesn't understand load management as well. Put it that way. But Rick Barnes also has principles. And I've heard some people tell me this. They, you know, what one of the things Rick Barnes says is to a lot of his players, you go play pro ball, you are going to be practicing intense the whole time. I'm trying to get you ready for that. So maybe in Rick Barnes' philosophy, he's like, I'd rather prepare these players for the pros, even if it means sacrificing wins for myself. Because Rick Barnes is, I've told you guys this, he's that altruistic. He's just in it for player development. That's what he's in this for. Rick Barnes with 79% of the vote, the vote so far on our YouTube page, Bruce Pearl with just 20%. So that's really what I wanted to know is, was it going to be 10, 20 or 30% of you out there that still are kind of holding on to that Bruce Pearl love? Maybe we'll do a Lane Kiffin, Josh Heupel poll tomorrow. I'll just let it go. I mean, I think that Bruce Pearl, just from a pragmatic standpoint, would be a better hire at Calhoun University. But if you're a Tennessee fan, which most of you are, don't vote for the guy that lied to the university and almost got your entire athletic department in NCAA trouble. Don't vote for that guy. I mean, we want to be different and have contrast, but that's not the guy you vote for. Do. And the guy who said he takes it personal when he admitted this, when Auburn beat Tennessee one time, he said, yeah, I take this game type of personally. You know, I want to get back at certain people. I'm like, you got yourself fired. Nobody like wrongly fired you, Bruce. Like you, like Bruce should take responsibility and say he let the fans down more than anything because fans would have, we, we were covering Tennessee at the time. And I can tell you, Dave, when I was covering them, you would agree that if had Mike Hamilton given Bruce Pearl a lifetime contract, every fan would have signed off on it and been fine. Yes. He blew that. Not, Anybody else? By the way, Lane Giffen versus Josh Heupel. Just want to say this. You'd rather have Josh Heupel, but for one game, X's and O's, Lane Giffen. Yeah, that's fair. Um, <laughs> I don't have a problem with that, but as a whole, um, I would I would definitely rather have, have Josh Heupel. And by the way, Josh Heupel was recruiting uh, pretty hot and heavy over the weekend, and uh, we, we had an opportunity to visit with a prospect that we'll tell you about here momentarily that was uh on campus it was a busy weekend for the balls go ahead and hit that like button if you could, could subscribe as well we would greatly appreciate that if you haven't subscribed yet you need to do that but uh tennessee with a pretty good group of prospects in over the weekend the one that stood out most to me is the one that if you turn your notifications on you would have known about so be sure and do that but the Vols are going after a Miami commitment in Waden Charles. He visited Knoxville this weekend, and he says he's still committed to Miami, but there's a strong tie there. His mentor, Chris Green, is close friends with former Vol Jawan Jennings. And when you look at this young man, Charles has offers from just about any place he wants to. We're talking about uh, LSU as one of the schools after him. Again, you can go to Off the Hook Sports and check out more Florida, Central Florida, Louisville. Uh, he is one of the top prospects in that South Florida area. So that's saying something compares himself to CeeDee Lamb and a guy that uh, is rated the 290 prospect overall in the nation, number 11 prospect in the country, um, and the number four, I'm sorry, the number 11 athlete prospect in the country and the number 42 prospect in Florida. This is a busy weekend for the balls. And a I'll say this, I think Josh Heupel long-term would have been a better recruiter in the old system because of the culture he built. Nowadays, all bets are off, and Lane Kiffin can throw money around. So nowadays, I have trouble telling you, Caleb, but in the old system, uh, Heupel's approach to recruiting would be better because he valued at least some character. Yeah, pro you were probably right on that. 
And but it also I still think it's better off in the new system at Tennessee because I think Tennessee is uniquely equipped in, to benefit from NIL more than other schools, and they don't benefit from regional talent the way other schools do. And so that's a that's a big reason I think Josh Heupel is still better off in this situation because I, you can call me crazy and we can talk about this another time, but I still think the Lane Kiffin thing is going to implode eventually. Yep, uh, very well. Could Dennis said, hey, guys, can you tell me when they took three seconds walking and dribbling uh, out of the rules of basketball? I did notice an absolute ton of carries uh, over the weekend, in particular in the Tennessee game. I hate getting caught up in officiating. Dennis, I just don't – I just want you to know you weren't the only one that saw that. It sounds a little old fuddy-duddy at times, but – it was true. The show represented by Banks and Jones. Hit like and subscribe. Banks and Jones? Well, it's because they're Tennessee's trial attorney. You can play to win with Banks and Jones because they'll go to trial. You've heard of other lawyers. They say they'll go to trial and fight for you. They won't. They just want to settle. That's the easiest way out. Well, that's not Banks and Jones, led by T. Scott Jones. They won't settle. They'll go to trial for you. Tennessee's trial attorney. They play to win. Truly, Tennessee's trial attorney when it comes to criminal defense or personal injury. Why settle? It's Banks and Jones. T. Scott Jones. Banksandjones.com. All right, let's get to this day in Tennessee sports history. Uh, this day in Tennessee sports history is brought to you by our good friend, Rick Terry. Rick Terry Jewelry Design. They want to be your jeweler looking for affordable game day jewelry. How about the Fire Opals, a Tennessee tradition? RickTerryJewelry.com, RickTerryJewelry.com. And you can uh, win some fantastic prizes if you're already in the Celebrity Bracket Challenge, uh, including a pair of those Fire Opal earrings, which are phenomenal. They are unbelievable. We'll get to... This day in Tennessee sports history in just a moment. Hang tight with us. We'll have it right after this. He's Caleb Calhoun. I'm Dave Hooker. This is a presentation of Off the Hook Sports. Just imagine having the best spas made right here in the United States of America in your backyard. What about that? Dynasty Pools and Spas. Their showroom is open in Athens right off the interstate. You can stop by and check out the best hot tubs and spas in the market. And then delivery, yes, they can do that. That's Knoxville or Chattanooga. They've got complete support spa cover and chemicals to keep your spa bubbling at its best. They also have pool chemicals as well. Dynasty pools and spas, amazing discounts for first responders, military, and even some blemish models that can save you a ton and no one will ever notice. Mention Off the Hook Sports, get $500 off. Mention Off the Hook Sports, get $500 off. Dynasty Pools and Spas. Go to DynastyPoolsAndSpas.com or stop by that showroom in Athens. DynastyPoolsAndSpas.com. Dynasty Pools and Spas. Welcome to Ray Varner Ford in Clinton, where every turn meets new possibilities and every mile celebrates cutting-edge innovation. Elevate your journey with our pre-owned selection of quality vehicles 2021 Ford Mustang 5.0 GT 33540. 2021 GMC Sierra 1500 Denali 4x4 46980. 2022 Ford Expedition King Ranch 4x4 67550. Local you trust? Pre owned vehicles you can afford. Ray Varner Ford, your East Tennessee Ford dealership. Sports Treasures in North Knoxville is one of the South's largest sports cards and memorabilia dealers featuring over 10 million sports cards from vintage to modern. Sports Treasures carries a full line of hobby boxes, singles, autographed memorabilia, Tennessee ball collectibles, fan cave decorations, and so much more. See a museum full of collectibles at Sports Treasures, 4819 North Broadway in Fountain City, and Sports Treasures on Facebook. Sports Treasures, where the real sports fan goes to shop. Have you seen the latest TriStar Hats Co. product? TriStar Hats Co., what's that? You know, those really cool hats, shirts, tumblers, and even license plates with three stars like the official Tennessee flag and stripes like the American flag. Pretty patriotic if you ask me. Ah, uh, gotcha. Seen those. Those are cool. Where can I get them? Simple. TriStarHatsCo.com. And if you order now, there's 10% on any order $50 or more. Plus, use the promo code HOOKED. 
with the promo code HOOKED, you get 10% off. That's HOOKED. And don't forget free shipping with any order over 50 bucks. Stock up at TriStarHatsCo.com. That's TriStarHatsCo.com. There are plenty of wannabes out there, so make sure you go to TriStarHatsCo.com for the best quality and customer service. Will do, and I'll be sure to use the promo code HOOK, that's HOOKED, when I do, to save an additional 10% off. TriStarHatsCo.com. TriStar Hats Co. is a trademark of TriStar Hats Co. LLC. Any use without express written consent is prohibited. Now in its 45th year, the second and third generations continue Joe Newbert's commitment. His vision of what this business needed to be, we still try to live up to that. Joe Newbert Collision Center. There we go. Welcome back. It is time to talk a little bit of Creighton off the hook sports. The Dave Hooker Show. Represented by Banks and Jones, Tennessee's trial attorney. Play to win, banksjones.com. Um, who's this guy? Hello, wizard. The Dave Hooker Show, Ooh. a presentation of Off the Hook Sports. What? YouTube, Apple, Spotify, and the free Off the Hook Sports app. Back to Dave Hooker. It will be Creighton. Tennessee will face Creighton. A full preview of the upcoming matchup is right now. It's brought to you by friends at Ray Varner Ford. What do you make of the Creighton matchup? It seems like a team and a program that everybody believes, and I said this last week, is going to be the next Gonzaga that is going to be a mid-major that takes a major step up. But it hasn't happened to this point. Is this their magical year? where they transform themselves into a maybe to a finally. I mean, that's certainly possible. If you remember, Gonzaga had a couple of runs when they were underdogs, and then they started to become favorites year in and year out. And actually, they had a little bit of issues, a few issues when they were favorites. All of a sudden, they were bouncing out early in the first round, early in the NCAA, early in the 2000s, excuse me. And then they started making their run kind of a little bit later. So, you know, you never really know how these things are going to work out. Greg McDermott has done more with Creighton than most coaches in um, the school's history. He's gotten them to an elite eight. So we have to give him credit on that. And that's kind of a big deal. So they're already starting to knock on the door a little bit more. I don't know if we're talking final four with them just yet. Like, they think this is their year, but, you know, a lot of things can happen, as we know. So it's hard to sit there and say that they're a Final Four team just yet. But I will say that Greg McDermott has helped them reach heights that they really never did reach before, even when they were kind of the Cinderella story all the time. True. Let's take a look at uh, if you go to offthehooksports.com, uh, you're welcome to follow along. But let's get a preview of Creighton. And this is how, if I were a head coach at a place like Creighton, I would build a basketball program. I would have one big man underneath because I know that I can't get what I call the Scotty Pippins of the world, the long guys, the positionless players. They're all over the place nowadays. But at a place like Creighton, you're not going to be able to get four or five of those guys at a time to compete with the upper echelon college basketball team. So I want a big dude, hopefully that can score, which they kind of sort of have. And then I want a bunch of three-point shooters. And that's exactly what they are. If you look uh, down in the paint, the front court, it's seven foot one, 270-pound Ryan Cockbrenner. Cockbrenner? Barely knew her. Uh, Cockbrenner is uh, a defensive force. He's going to be really good. They're going to try to play the perimeter, funnel you down low. So Tennessee's going to have to be smart with the basketball. I think they're going to have to make some mid-range jumpers, as a matter of fact, which we never say anymore. And then along the outside, they've got a bunch of guys who can hit threes. The thing is, they're not deep really at all. And I believe Tennessee uh, should be uh, much more athletic than Creighton, although Cockbrenner will provide a challenge. Uh, there just aren't that many players as big as him in college basketball but ultimately i think top to bottom tennessee has a better team than creighton and i i really don't think it's that incredibly close you 
No, I don't think it's that close either. They're going to have to... Um, you are going to find me crazy after the way I've criticized him over the past. But honestly, this is the type of game where Rick Barnes would do well to give John Calipari a call. And the reason I say that is the dribble drive would work perfect perfect in this game because every time you slide, you're right, These they're going to have their unathletic guards play the perimeter really, really, really aggressively. And then they're going to rely on Cockburner down low if they get past it to try to drive to the basket. If you do the dribble drive and just keep kicking out every time you get to the basket, you will have beaten them and you'll leave a lane open for three behind you because they're going to try to stay with you the whole time and they're not going to be able to recover to get back to block any shots from the three-point line. So I would actually say, I mean, could you imagine just Zakai Ziegler driving to the basket every single time? He's going to kick it out and someone's going to be open every time he does that. And yeah. so I would do that. I would play small. And if I'm Rick Barnes, I would, I'd literally go Nolan Richardson, 1994, 40 minutes of hell. I'd press the whole game. I wouldn't have a problem with that, and they can do that. I I actually really like that idea. Um, and as far as creating points, yes, dribble drive would be a way to go, but they're not going to make some sort of massive change. And we all know Dalton Connect can kind of dribble drive on himself and create his own shot. So no, it wouldn't be Dalton I, anyway. He's not athletic enough. It'd be Sakai dribble driving and even Josiah. You don't think Dalton Connect's athletic enough? Dribble drive, you have to be uniquely more athletic than the person quicker, uniquely quicker than the person in front of you. So oh, that's I why I think he's quicker than the person ahead of him every almost every game. Because he's, I think he's, he's going against the three, he's not going against the two. True, that's a fair point. You're right. And they have, but I, I think usually in this motion offense, Dalton Connect typically is able to get to the right spot on the court. But I don't really see him beat guys off the dribble going to the basket a lot um that much i haven't seen a lot of that this year um no i guess sometimes they overplay him and i've I've seen him get there i maybe i think he's a little bit more uh athletic than you nevertheless um what do you think of the matchup just in general i mean i'm with you it's, it's a little bit of a tricky matchup because of how because of the interior and they will have to rely on the mid-range with the high low i think they can do it because what you might end up doing is pulling Adu a little bit away from the basket and have him kind of hit some of those 15 footers. You know what I mean? And uh, Adu and Josiah, if you have, if you have Josiah, this actually could be a big game for Josiah. Whereas if he can hit some 15 footers right there, like at the free throw line a lot, then you could really have a good game uh, plan going forward. Now you, you've told me before that you thought, uh, Jonas Adu was the most important player on this team, game in and game out. What about this matchup? Is he still Umero Numero, uh, number one most important player? Brought to you by Sports Treasures, carrying over 5 million sports treasures and so much more. Follow on Facebook for the best in sports memorabilia daily updates at Sports Treasures TN. Sports Treasures TN. So let me ask you that. What do you? What do you think when I pose that query to you? I mean, I would like to say he should be the most important player, but I think um, Ryan Cockburner is the type of player that will just totally negate Jonas, him. Jonas Ado is soft. I have to say that he's soft no. and Cockburner will work him in. I, I think is going to mentally wreck him. I, I'm sorry. I don't have faith in Jonas Adu to actually win those battles underneath the basket. Okay. Well then, then who's the most important player? Is it as simple as connect? It's connect. Connect's just got to score a lot. This is, they need like a 45 point game from and, and Ziegler connect and Ziegler together. Um, and James just not, because, because of Creighton's interior, James is going to have to do a lot of, a lot of offense in this game that he usually doesn't do. Okay, what would you like to see out of Connect if he's suddenly the most important player instead of Adu? I want to see Connect do what I actually just brought up with James. I think Connect should catch a lot. Should um, they should work to get Connect the ball at the free throw line a lot of times, and then he can have a little bit to work with, determine if he wants to try to drive and go up against golf runners, or there should be somebody open. I mean, Connect's actually an underrated passer. A lot of people don't really notice that about him because he scores so much, but 
you can't really trap him. He almost always finds the open guy. So I want to see Connect get the ball at the free throw line, and I want to see what they can do with him there. I think Josiah is going to have to somewhat be underneath the basket because Creighton actually runs uh, Baylor Shearman, who is their leading scorer, their 6'6 guard. They play him down low a lot. I mean, he's averaging nine rebounds a game. And Josiah is going to be responsible for pulling him away from the basket. Because I can't pull him away from the basket unless Josiah hits a couple of threes. Um, uh, yeah. So who would be your top four most important players? I'm gonna go connect Ziegler. I'm gonna go Adu. You know, maybe now the flip side of him not being as big and as physical as the Purdue big man, uh Cockbrenner, is he's gonna be able to get down the field or down the court a lot faster. So he could get a few gimme points just from being more athletic and did, getting down the court. So I, I am going to go connect uh, Ziegler, uh, Jonas, and who else do you want on there? Who's the most important player versus Creighton? Connect Ziegler. Oh, Josiah. Josiah. Yeah. All right. So and that's what this is where you're right. This is where Josiah, this is where the defense should really step up. They need to force turnovers all game long if they can. I mean, they, this is why I mean they need to press and play transition basketball. I mean, we need to see Bruce Pearl 2006. Yep. Vote on our poll question right now. Vote on our poll question right now, and you'll be glad that you did because we want to get a good feel for you and what you're thinking about uh, this this upcoming matchup. I I look in retrospect, and I think Tennessee got a really good draw. I didn't think Texas was very good. Um, I thought Tennessee beats them by 20 if they're making easy shots. And St. Peter's was horrible. We were talking earlier, does Rick Barnes get the benefit of the doubt in drawings in, in the in the tournament? I certainly think he did this year. Yeah, they got a good drawing this year in the tournament. Um, I think they would have rather played Oregon than Creighton. I don't know if you guys watched that game the other night um, after Tennessee. They would have much rather played Oregon but they're still happy with this draw. The only thing I don't like for them is this weekend, and you're looking far ahead, you know, Creighton's the one that should matter, but who decided that Tennessee should play the last game on Friday? And if they win, they're going to play the first game on Sunday? Uh, I don't know. So that's how the schedule shakes out. They play the last game on Friday and the first game on Sunday. Why, do, why are they doing that? The Detroit, yeah, the final in the, in the Detroit region is at 2.20 on Sunday, meaning that Tennessee could be playing, and they're playing at 10.07 Friday night. So they could be playing into 1 o'clock Saturday morning and then have to turn around and go play at 2.20 on Sunday afternoon. Yeah, but is that really a big deal? I think it is for college kids, yeah. I mean, the well, NBA Players Union has actually uh, pulled off 48 hours, or uh, 44 hours, I think, mandatory rest after games. And you won't even have college just do that now? Well, but you say for college kids, I mean, I don't know about you, but I could bounce back pretty quick when I was 19, 20, 21, and 22. Wouldn't have been a big deal for me. I'd have been just fine. There has been, weirdly, the more veteran teams in the NBA that are usually older have handled the grueling stretch of a season much better than younger teams in the past. Um, now, that could be because they're older. They know how to pace themselves for the year. They're smarter about that. Exactly what it is. And please don't pick Kawhi Leonard out of that group who only plays like 68 <laughs> games. Hit like in his career or for a year. <laughs> hit, hit like and subscribe. We appreciate that. Go ahead and get on board. Let's get your thoughts on the message board as well, as we always like to check that out. And it is absolutely lit up. As uh, Arthur says, Viscobia, Waka, Ziegler, Connect, and Australia. I definitely don't think those are the five most important. So he must be referring to uh, something else. Um, I just don't think there's any way that uh, a dude is going to have two games in a row like he had, even though. He seems physically outmatched by the Purdue. Did I say Purdue again? I'm I'm so sorry. Yes. Creighton, Creighton, big man. I got Edie on the brain for some reason after watching last night. But um, the uh, Kalkbrenner, I, I I think that I'm not a hundred percent sure that he's going to dominate. I do. I think that he will. 
I think that it's going to be Tennessee to find something different, but I would imagine that uh, a do is much more athletic than Cockburner, wouldn't you? I would think he he is, and he's not that small. I mean, he's six eleven. Cockburner seven one. So you're right; that could help. And Adu could pull a Cockburner. If the thing is, Adu can hit those fifteen footers, and if he can do that, then and pull Cockburner away from the basket, then we, we're talking about a totally different game at that point. I mean, Tennessee will be able to drive to the basket every single time. That's going to be difficult. But if he could start doing that, it would be a huge help. But yeah, I think the biggest thing you are right is. Adu is everything I'm knocking about him now about being soft. He's still actually good defensively and he knows how to contest shots and he knows how to deny the paint. If he can deny from Cockburner from getting the ball on the other side of the, on the other side, then Tennessee's in very good chance. I think this is one of those, Dave, I think this is one of those play the passing lanes every time play the passing lanes, go for the steal every single time. No, I'm cool with that. I think that's actually a, a pretty good idea. I think it's going to be really difficult uh, to, to be able to, Cross court pass it, find open men. If if you're doing that and you're playing passing lanes, uh, anything else you want to add to the Creighton matchup? No, I mean I think this all. The only other thing is people are talking about it being in Detroit at uh, which is it's the Midwest bracket and Creighton's from Nebraska and Tennessee has to come from the South. But guys, I think Tennessee fans are going to outmatch Detroit uh, Creighton fans at this game. I don't think. You Can have you to look that up again and see where the venue is? I know we, we um, had this discussion last week, but I hope it's not at that Lucas Oil Field or whatever it is. No, that's in Indianapolis, what you're thinking of right there. Okay, um, or whatever the new – it's not Ford Field, is it? I thought they changed uh, it. No, this, no, it's at the it's at the Pistons Arena, Little Caesars Arena. Okay, um, I'm completely yeah. fine with that. So I would rather see that than half of a – half of a football arena when they cut it in half. So here's what you need need to do, Tennessee fans. You're worth probably six, eight points if you go up there and jam that place. And Marquette's a little bitty school. Uh, it's I, I'm sure the attendance is nowhere close what Tennessee is. Go up there and buy a ton of tickets. You mean Creighton, not Marquette. Creighton. What, what haven't I called Creighton today? I've called them Purdue. I've called them Marquette. Tennessee is playing Creighton. I studied them all day yesterday. And I keep calling them the wrong name. So, uh, is Purdue a are, Jesuit school? Are you just mixing up Jesuits? I don't, I don't know. Let's just say they're playing great, and we'll, we'll we'll go with that. Uh, also, this day in uh, Tennessee sports history, we promised you that a little bit early earlier. Got to that. This day in uh, Tennessee sports history, brought to you by our good friends at Ray Varner Ford. What do you got for me? Um, so this day in Tennessee sports history, this would be now uh, 29, excuse me, 28 years ago. The Lady Vols beat Virginia in the Elite Eight, 52 to 46, to advance to the Final Four. It was Shamika Holtzclaw's freshman year, uh -huh. and that sparked their three-peat with Shamika Holtzclaw from 96 to 98. Um, the next game, they actually beat UConn in overtime. 88 to 83, and then beat Georgia to win the national title. It was the peak. It began the peak of the Pat Summit run during her time at Tennessee. Certainly did. Coming up, guys, there's something you're going to need to watch, and you're going to need to watch closely if you're a college football fan because there's going to be a big scandal or serious accident, whatever you want to call it, because there are a lot of kids getting in cars that are not ready for what they're buying. I'll tell you what. Uh, what I heard over the weekend. Also, uh, SEC tournament failures coming up. Is that an embarrassment for Greg Sankey? Uh, we'll get to that. Uh, we've got a lot to get to, so stay stay tuned. Four downs as well. Brought to you by Dynasty Pools and Spas. We'll be back in two minutes. He's Caleb Calhoun. I'm Dave Hooker off Thug Sports. Welcome to Ray Varner Ford in Clinton, where every turn meets new possibilities and every mile celebrates cutting edge innovation. Elevate your journey with our pre-owned selection of quality vehicles. 2021 Ford Mustang 5.0 GT, 33540. 2021 GMC Sierra 1500 Denali 4x4, 46980. 2022 Ford Expedition King Ranch 4x4, 67550. Local you trust, pre-owned vehicles you can afford. Ray Varner Ford, your East Tennessee Ford dealership. 
Sports Treasures in North Knoxville is one of the South's largest sports cards and memorabilia dealers, featuring over 10 million sports cards from vintage to modern. Sports Treasures carries a full line of hobby boxes, singles, autographed memorabilia, tennis evolved collectibles, fan cave decorations, and so much more. See a museum full of collectibles at Sports Treasures, 4819 North Broadway in Fountain City, and Sports Treasures on Facebook. Sports Treasures, where the real sports fan goes to shop. Have you seen the latest TriStar Hats Co. product? TriStar Hats Co., what's that? You know, those really cool hats, shirts, tumblers, and even license plates with three stars like the official Tennessee flag and stripes like the American flag. Pretty patriotic if you ask me. Ah, I got you. Seen those. Those are cool. Where can I get them? Simple. TriStarHatsCo.com. And if you order now, there's 10% on any order $50 or more. Plus, use the promo code HOOKED. With the promo code HOOKED, you get 10% off. That's HOOKED. And don't forget free shipping with any order over 50 bucks. Stock up at TriStarHatsCo.com. That's TriStarHatsCo.com. There are plenty of wannabes out there, so make sure you go to TriStarHatsCo.com for the best quality and customer service. Will do, and I'll be sure to use the promo code HOOKED. That's HOOKED when I do to save an additional 10% off. TriStarHatsCo.com. TriStar Hats Co. is a trademark of TriStar Hats Co. LLC. Any use without express written consent is prohibited. Now in its 45th year, the second and third generations continue Joe Newbert's commitment. His vision of what this business needed to be, we still try to live up to that. Joe Newbert Collision Center. The Dave Hooker Show, represented by Banks and Jones. Tennessee's trial attorneys. Excuse me, Your Honor. Play to win. Banksjones.com. Um, who's this guy? Hello, wizard. The Dave Hooker Show. Who? A presentation of Off the Hook Sports. What? YouTube, Apple, Spotify, and the free Off the Hook Sports app. Back to Dave Hooker. Not. The banner weekend for the SEC and their basketball programs. Ugh. What was the final record for the SEC, Caleb? Oh, I don't know the exact final record. Let me look that up. But I know half of them lost. How many of the the teams lost? How many of the teams are still alive? I think Uh, just Alabama and Tennessee are still still alive. That's it. Um, Obviously, Kentucky was a very easy draw. Yeah, Kentucky was the the big one that got knocked out, uh, and I think a lot of people thought that they were uh, their best basketball was ahead of them this particular team. But I ask you: is the fact that the SEC has struggled in the NCAA tournament is that embarrassing for the SEC? Caleb, what are your thoughts? So the SEC specifically, I don't put too much stock into conference tur- to conference performance in postseason. I never did in bowl games. Remember back in the day before the playoff when everybody was like, I want my conference teams to win all the time. I didn't care. Okay. Like what? Oh, wow. The SEC went seven and three in bowl games. That really says something or four and six or who cares? It was bowl games. Okay. Tur- the tournament obviously has, there's more to play for. So I get it, but the way it's structured and set up is just designed for fluke freak things to happen every year. And so it's just so not indicative of a season. And I've never thought it was indicative of a season. So I don't put too much stock on it from that perspective. But I put a however or a, but there you go. But I put a lot of stock on it from the idiocy dribble that Greg Sinke spewed two weeks ago, heading into the tournament. Which was? He touted these lower level teams that were bubble teams that were upsetting or playing these better teams close and said, this is proof that we should have more bids basically for power conferences in the NCAA tournament and take them away from auto conferences. Well, no, that's not proof, Greg. Okay? Because just because a team plays a team close does not mean they deserve to go to the NCAA tournament. And this proves that. You made that case, Greg, to say that there should be more SEC teams in the NCAA tournament instead of these smaller level teams to point out it would make for better basketball. And then you'll watch Kentucky play Oakland. You really see that game and go, you know, you know what really could have fixed this tournament? Having another SEC team in there. That wouldn't have done that. Poll That's what questions. people wanted to see. Poll question up now. Do you root for the SEC when your team isn't playing? Yes, conference 
pride know they're dead to me. Here's why Caleb's wrong in everything he just said. And it sounded good, and it was an impassioned plea, and that was impressive, but he was just absolutely wrong in everything he said. And I'm going to tell you what. First, I want to tell you about boundless moving from their two-hour minimum to turnkey operations. They have you covered. That's boundless moving. That's who I used. They're in Charlotte, also in East Tennessee. Basketball's a toy for the SEC. Greg Sankey can float that balloon out there, which, by the way, let's be honest, everybody is backed off expanding the tournament. That was a balloon floated out there by Sankey and some other people leaked just to find out what the public would say. And the public would say, heck no, that's too long. That's what they said. So that's all he did. He floated it out there. It wasn't his fault. When you have a a toy in an adolescent sense, you can ram that little uh, Porsche against the wall if you want to. When you have a toy in terms of a big boy sense, you don't ram your real Porsche into the wall for funsies. That's what football is. So whatever he does with basketball, I think is to some extent just casting a line to see what he can pull back in to make it a bigger sport. I think that's what he said when he said that about the NCAA tournament expansion. I think though he was ready and willing for everybody to come back and say, no, that's a bad idea. He just threw that out there. I don't think he was ever serious at all. One, he's never one. The reason I break from you, it's not like Greg Sinke thinks from what the public wants ever. Okay. This guy was the most instrumental in getting the 12 team playoff. And before we even got started with that, he went back and said, Hey, how about a 14 team playoff? And now they're doing it. Even though every fan was like, wait, we don't want that Two, I never listen to what the public wants because the public is so short sighted. This same public that begged for an expanded college football playoff for years is now mad that they want to expand more. I'm like, guys, this is what, what did you think was going to happen? The minute well, no, that's that's play- apples and oranges. I mean, that's I, like that's like saying, "Oh, I, I like my uh, my chicken fried, and I like my steak grilled." Those are two. Co- I mean, basketball and football are two completely separate things. What I'm saying is, Greg Sinky doesn't take the public into account. He takes money into account. He loves him some money, and you know, I will say, football fields are green, which is the color of money, and basketball courts are not green. And so all I'm saying is that he floated that because of the unit payouts for SEC teams in the NCAA sure. tournament. No doubt. And, and which is. You want to explain actually, the unit payouts that they get for those that don't know. A conference gets $2 million for every single NCAA tournament game. One of its representatives plays on. Right. And there are a potential of 135 units in a season. Uh, or in a tournament, excuse me, an NCAA tournament. So you want as many teams in there as possible. He wants more of those units for the SEC. Now, again, it's short-sighted. He is losing, and college basketball will hemorrhage an entire collection of fans across the country by doing this, the same way college football has, by the way, and is going to in the future. Um, college basketball is would hemorrhage that too because half of March Madness, half of its draw is people who would never even watch the sport but have fun seeing these smaller schools go far. If you just put all the good teams in the tournament or the power conference teams, the fans of those power conference teams would never watch the regular season because they know their team's going to the tournament, so really, who cares? And the average casual fan wouldn't come during March. And this is the flaw of what he's what he proposed, and he looks ridiculous for what happened over the weekend after he proposed that. I think he just floated a balloon up there. I mean, I see where you're coming from, but I don't think this was anything serious. And I'm going to go back to the very point you started your argument with. And that is you usually don't place too much in one tournament because there can be a bad run of draws. I mean, what's the SEC record been like over the past 10 years? Again, I'll I'll say this. If you want to fix it, you can. This is why it's a toy and not a real toy. It's a a toy Porsche, not a real Porsche. 
if Tennessee wanted to fix this, they'd wait for the ACC to break up and go for my very unorthodox move of adding Duke and North Carolina. Then they'd be a basketball school and they could control basketball like they control football. But they're not going to do that. Why? Because they don't care. It all comes down to money. More money comes in from football by far, about five times the amount than comes in from basketball. So th- th- this that to guy's me, probably bigger in the SEC, isn't it? Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if if he's testing this stuff out for logistics purposes to see if he can move a football team from one side of the country to another. I just when they t- when the SEC talks basketball, I just in my mind, kind of shake my head just like I would if I were in the ACC and they were talking football. Like, uh, maybe we need to watch what the SEC is doing. And the SEC is like, maybe we need to watch what the ACC is doing in basketball. So I just, I don't take a lot into account when Greg Sankey talks about basketball because he's ultimately going to be judged on what he does in football and football alone, right? Yes, I agree with that. And it's funny you say that the ACC talks football too. They just can't compete in football, but they realize football is their cash cow, which is why if they lose Clemson and Florida State, they're not surviving. Because not like they could sit there and be like, well, we got all the basketball schools, guys. It's like, yeah, ESPN is going to be like, yeah, we gave you that contract because we wanted the football schools. And so I will give you that. I still think. I think it's dangerous that he floated it because I just don't, because I'm not putting it past him to do it. And by the way, I guys with this power conference, it's going to happen. What? I don't think the sec should exist in five years. Neither should the big 10. I don't think these conferences have any need to exist. Five years. I, don't know what, I like the, I'm going to go nostalgia guy. I like the fact that there are conferences, but need or not. Want or, then, not, want or not by Dave Hooker, that is going to be the case in five years. No Dave, matter what I, I you, want or what I need. Yeah, I like the fact that there are conferences too. I want to go back to 1990 where you had like 10 teams to a conference. Okay, I want the old SEC. Kick out Arkansas, Texas, Oklahoma, Missouri, and South Carolina. I want them all gone, okay? I want the old 10-team SEC, the old Southwest, the old Big Eight. I want all that back. But in this new age of super mega conferences, Eventually, there's no point of them. Just like baseball, and and and, and I, I, baseball eventually had to realize, and it took till what 1997 before they realized, hey, why do these leagues operate independently of each other? We're all under the Major League Baseball umbrella. Why are we out here like pretending we're separate? Okay, so I mean, they're still practically doing that, which is why one of the many reasons why the NFL pr- surpassed them long, long ago. I mean, the top three sports in the 1950s were what? Boxing, horse racing, and Major League Baseball. Yeah, no, that's true. You are right. Exactly. Baseball is trying to, you have to go, whatever you do, I do believe in this. Whichever way you decide to go, you have to go all in on it, right? So you can either be like 1990 and have everything separated, have college football hyper regional the way I want it, or you can go the mega conferences route. But if you go the mega conferences route, then you shouldn't have the conferences. You should just have one mega conference and have that be the league and they're all independent and they all play each other. And Yeah, I mean, but don't you want to hear the SEC? Don't you? I mean, no, don't you? Not anymore. That doesn't what, do with big... Arkansas and Texas and and uh, Okay, but what if it's Oklahoma? what if it's what's it, what if it's Tennessee. analogous to the NFC? Like I, I have some NFC East pride. Now I don't root for their teams if they move forward, but I like it when the NFC East is better. I know that may sound stupid to you, How but many teams are in the NFC East, Dave. They're four. Yes. Okay. You're talking about that versus the what if, what if the <clears throat> NFC East went and gobbled up the NFC South in the AFC West? Okay. And so then what you gonna say? Oh, that cold. Um All I'm saying is, one, and you still, the SEC East pride, you got to remember this. Part of the SEC pride was, it was, it was a uniting thing behind, with college athletics in general, it was very, it was so hyper-regional. Okay, you know this, Dave, recruiting, most recruiting until the 1990s was local, right? Outside of Notre Dame, everybody recruited local. And so recruiting was local. So the success of programs and conferences was really reflective on where you lived. So you actually took massive regional pride 
because it was just kind of a representation of where you lived in your culture and your life. And not just the SEC, but the Big Ten, the Pac-12, the Northeast, like all these cultural parts of the country that that's what the Bulls were for to create that fun. That doesn't exist anymore. Like, I'm sorry, but people, I mean, I have to explain this to people up north a lot of times, but Tennessee shares nothing culturally in common with Texas. Okay. Uh, like Knoxville and Austin are not the same. No, I, I agree that it doesn't feel like the air quotes South to me, but they're a lot closer than say California. Right. Okay. But then let's not go to the Big Ten. Not geographically, just mindset. Now tell me what USC and um, Ohio State share culturally. Oh, well, I'm not arguing that one. No, I mean, I no, you're right. I mean, they have nothing culturally. That was a very odd move. and But it's because the Pac-12 couldn't get off its duff to put something together that they could present to a network in terms of a 14-team playoff because that's where they are now. I mean, the ACC was locked into the contract. The Pac-12 wasn't aggressive enough. So the Big Ten swooped in and made the first major move in shaking things up. I, I, that's not the Big Ten's fault. No, I'm not blaming the Big Ten. What I'm saying is, in general, once that happened, once he went down that road and the SEC started it, by the way, they started it when they added Missouri. Well, Maryland started it, or the Big Ten added it, did it with adding Maryland and Rutgers, which have nothing in common culturally with the Big Ten. But the SEC went down the rabbit hole too. And actually, the SEC did it first and then the Big Ten. So the SEC did start it with Missouri. When you focused on TV markets and then brand size and revenue power, you can't then sit there and say, let's have some cultural pride in what we do. There is no such thing as that or regional pride. It's dead. These conferences shouldn't exist. Okay. I I'm I'm if you're a Tennessee fan, you don't see like, I'm sorry, Alabama's national championship is not your national championship. No. Okay. And it helps their rivals recruit. I understand that. Somebody put that on the message board. To me, it's all about people. I don't I didn't want to see NATO twin. Um that's what John I was Paul, too. What's that? That's how I am too. With yeah. I'm, yeah. Well, I'm just about people in general. I didn't really want to see NATO twin. Uh I think it was uh, better drama if John Calipari lost early. So at the end of that game, I was rooting more for content. But no, I we can get into that debate one day about whether or not you should root for your SEC brethren, but the simple fact in football is that it helps you in recruiting immensely to have a monstrous win streak over one of your rivals. We've seen it before. Yes, not for a conference to be dominant over another conference, though. Okay, the SEC dominated college football from 2000. They won every national title from 2006 to 2012. Want to know who didn't win a national title in that time? Tennessee. Didn't help them at all. Yeah. Show represented by Banks and Jones, Apex Apparel Group Design call to action is this. 15% off your first order. How awesome is that? Call Tyler, 865-919-3001, 865-919-3001. I am telling you that they have just about everything you can imagine in terms of promo material for your business they've got the spirit where too they've got it all right there at apex apparel go go to your apex apparel.com just down below your apex apparel.com or just call tyler 865-919-3001 865-919-3001 we kind of headed this in one direction and got away from it should greg sankey be embarrassed over the sec's tournament failures and they've been bad, I, I say absolutely not because I think it's a little bitty toy. Now, if, if the SEC started going 0-8 in college football playoff games, I think you've got a problem, but I don't believe that's going to happen. Neither do you. This is a toy for the SEC. This is not the, the, the main business they run on a day-to-day -day basis. I think he still should be embarrassed because of how he floated it. And because I don't think he has all of his ducks in a row. And I'm just going to say that with the ACC or the SEC. This is it. In two weeks, he floated that quickly went to the 14 team playoff where it's clear that he hasn't ironed out the details yet. And also let's not forget put in that eight game schedule for 2025 when we know that's not even staying because he clearly wants nine. So I don't think Greg Sankey has any ducks in a row right now. 
you know, in his defense, it's a really hard time to line up ducks. I mean, <laughs> with all that's changing to defend him for just a second, you know, there have been times in college football history when it wasn't that hard to line up ducks. But right now, those ducks are running all over the place. They're getting money from people. They're going to other duck universities. I mean, I think you should probably cut him some slack just a little bit. Mm, he's part of the reason it's impossible to get ducks in a row. He has scrambled the ducks more than anybody. It's like ducks on stimulants. They're running all over the place. Four downs brought to you by Dynasty Pools and Spas. Guys, I'm telling you, you got a traffic problem. It's coming to your school. It's already at Georgia, and it's coming your way. Four Downs brought to you by Dynasty Spas, the most comfortable spas made in the United States of America, right here in East Tennessee. Drop in for the all-new showroom in Athens, Dynasty Spas, perfect for all four seasons. Four Downs presented by Off the Hook Sports. You know, Trevor Etienne was at Florida, transferred to Georgia. Now he has a DUI. That's a nor another Georgia traffic arrest, and it's been round about 14 in recent memory. Here's the problem. It's not that Trevor Etienne is necessarily a bad guy, nor is it necessarily the case that there's a bad guy that's going to get in trouble with a super fast car here in the near future. I don't know what he was driving particularly, but talking to some people in the NIL game over the weekend, Guys are going out and they're buying at some price levels, sixty, seventy thousand dollars sport cars. Other price levels, over two hundred thousand dollars in sports cars. I have a car that's pretty, pretty peppy, pretty quick. I did not need to drive that when I was nineteen or twenty years old. And I know that we think this is a Georgia problem right now, but I think there's a little more to it than that. Let's hop in the hot tub with Cooper Mays and start to break it down as far as where Georgia is, the SEC, and even Tennessee. Cooper Mays here. Hit like and subscribe. We'll do it, Coop. What down? Coop here. First down. How big of a problem is this for Georgia, Caleb Calhoun? It's huge. Um, and I say it's huge because you bring up all the time, once the discipline goes out the window, you can't get it back. And True. also – Here's the real truth. The discipline problems start first, but you don't see the results on the field falter just immediately, right? Like you still see things are still going well, but then there's a game. Then there's a moment that it's a loss, but you just think it's a loss and you don't think it's triggering a downward spiral, but then it triggered a downward spiral. The best example of that I always give you is the 2009 SEC championship game. That Florida loss to Alabama wasn't just a loss. That was the triggering of Florida completely spiraling under Urban Meyer, wasn't it? Yes. And it's it's okay to let people break rules. Everybody will back you when you're winning. And that's not a big deal. But once he started losing, yeah, he lost a lot of support. So even though every school in the country could have as many traffic arrests, which they don't, but they could – this is still a problem for Georgia because you wonder if Kirby Smart loses any leverage at all to national champions. Yes. It's probably not, but it could get to that point. Right? Exactly. It, oh, sorry. Second down. Oh, sorry. Second down. I want you to finish your point, but how much of Georgia's problem is NIL money having sports cars? We saw that um, uh, their their new is his name escapes me all of a sudden. Their their brand new quarterback who played last year. Oh my goodness, Carson Beck. All right, so uh, we saw that Carson Beck had what, a Lambo. I mean, you you look at the roads there too. There are a lot of long straight roads. Not that I've ever thought about this, but how much of this is a Georgia unique problem with NIL and the roads they have there? I don't know if it's unique with Georgia. I, maybe the driving thing is, but discipline's going to become a problem in college football everywhere. Because here's the issue: <laughs> you don't have a boss. Yeah, coaches can't roll with an iron fist anymore. So they can't even roll with a fist. They've got to roll with yeah. a pat on the butt and say, please. Player commits a crime. You kick him off the team. What if another star player is that player's best friend? And he said, you know what? 
I don't want to be here anymore because you kicked my best friend off the team. I'm going to follow my best friend to another school that's going to take him. And we're going to go together. And two other players are going to do it. And hey, Trevor says, portal. I think Trevor's a Georgia fan here. Trevor says, this is the only thing that UT fans can laugh about. I'm not laughing. I think this is a serious problem. And I think there's a good chance it could be a serious problem at Tennessee, at Alabama. Well, Florida doesn't know how to pay players, so probably not Florida. I think a lot of schools could have a serious issue with traffic incidents because they're getting sports cars that are, are way too fast for them to be equipped to drive at that age. Yeah, this is – yeah, I think Trevor just missed the point. We said second down, this is an NIL problem and a transfer portal problem. Like, we're not saying it's a Georgia problem at all. I will say, though – we are uniquely qualified to talk about this as a Georgia problem because we know what it, Tennessee had the same problem in the early 2000s and it derailed the football program at that time. And I just, I, you know, I, it's funny. 2002 was the first sign you first year you saw majors cracks in the armor with the eight and five season. Remember? Yes. Well, what happened? What happened in 2001? Tennessee was upset in the SEC title game at the time. We all just thought that was just a bad upset loss, right? We didn't think it was indicative of a larger downward trend of the program. And it was. No, I did. Yeah. I really thought it was part of a continued upward twin, uh, upward trend of the program um, and that they just played a bad half of football. Boy, was I wrong about that. Hit that like yeah. and subscribe button. Let's go ahead and get you on board right now. Four downs brought to you by Dynasty Pools and Spas. What down, Coop? Tennessee Center Cooper Mays here. Third down. If Kirby Smart is a nine-win coach instead of a national championship winning coach, is he's if he's averaging nine wins, is he on the hot seat with this sort of issue? He's not on well, he's no, on but he because this could kill people. Well, he's that's on, what I was about to say. He won't be on the hot seat just with nine wins, but it will no, 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 not nine wins in a season. I'm sorry. An average averaging nine wins. If he's not a championship coach and the Nick Saban, if he's average guy. If he's Eli Drinkwitz, is this a big time problem for him? Because nothing's a big time problem when you're winning big. Nothing. Well, there's a big difference between big time problem and hot seat. So here's where I'm getting at. Nine okay. wins a season, he won't be on the hot seat. But you will see story after story after story after story on Kirby Smart losing control of the program. If you see all of those stories, you will start to see recruits steering away from Georgia. I shouldn't say steer in this context. No yeah, no, I, I, I think we kind of. I think you and I are making two different points in some sense. I'm saying if to this point Kirby Smart wasn't a championship type coach, would the pressure from outside of the program being all the traffic incidents put him on the hot seat? Would that be kind of like the straw that would break the camel's back? It, I say yes because Mark Richt was winning 10 games before that. A year. It would eventually get him on the hot seat, yes, because also the program would implode. Because what happened, again, I bring it back to Fulmer, the coverage of Fulmer – and him losing control wrecked Fulmer's ability to recruit, didn't it? Yes. And it it it, it was. I, do you remember the 2007 season? They win the East, but there was a story every week on how Fulmer had lost the program in national media. And 2008 was the worst recruiting class he had ever signed, even though he had just won the East in 2007. And I made the connection at the time that was because of all the coverage of him while he was trying to recruit at that time. I'm not saying he didn't deserve it. He just he earned every bit of that negative coverage, but it. There was all that coverage when he was recruiting and not the same coverage when he actually won the East to play for the SEC title that year in 07. All right. Is it time for the SEC to step in? Fourth down, Dynasty Pools and Spas. Just imagine having the best spas made right here in the United States of America in your backyard. What about that? Dynasty Pools and Spas. Their showroom is open in Athens right off the interstate. You can stop by and check out the best hot tubs and spas in the market. And then delivery, yes, they can do that. It's Knoxville or Chattanooga. They've got complete support, spa cover, and chemicals to keep your spa bubbling at its best. They also have pool chemicals as well. Dynasty Pools and Spas, amazing discounts for first responders, military, and even some blemish models. It can save you a ton, and no one will ever notice. Mention Off the Hook Sports, get $500 off. Mention Off the Hook Sports, get $500 off. Dynasty Pools and Spas. Go to DynastyPoolsAndSpas.com or stop by that showroom in Athens. DynastyPoolsAndSpas.com. Dynasty Pools and Spas. Caleb, 
should the SEC step in? I, I can't say they should yet. Yes, they should. People could die here, Caleb. Well, See, this is bigger. This is bigger than football. This is why I was. I well, someone was, already so has good. died. Let's be fair. With Jalen Carter, someone already did. Yeah, somebody die. has died. I mean, somebody else could die. I thought it was bizarro that Alabama basketball was allowed to continue on last year with the gun issue that they had that led the, to a shooting. Yes, the SEC should step in if it's something that's if it's something across the board. If it's something that appears to be a part of the program, and this is to the point that it does, the SEC needs to step in. They need to suspend people. But I thought they needed to deal out discipline the whole time. They just don't want to. It's a conflict of interest for Kirby Smart. I mean, what about – what if the legal system starts to step in a little bit more? Where you actually feel the consequences of doing these things? Because we're throwing people in jail for smoking a little weed, but you can get a DUI going 100 down, miles an hour down a road and kill somebody. And you get a lesser punishment. And so maybe it's, I, I'm not going to go with the SEC when I think our legal system is totally messed up and how we go with these people. I think that, for instance, the Henry Rugg situation, which was awful, but there should maybe be hard prison sentences for anybody who gets drunk and drives 110 miles an hour down a residential road. I mean, Joe like, Newbert Collision Center. No, I don't have a problem with that. Joe Newbert Collision Center for nearly 50 years. Newbert Collision Center has East Tennessee's been East Tennessee's best choice for quality repair work and fantastic customer service. Go to Joe Newbert collision.com Joe Newbert collision.com Newbert collision centers. So I, I mean, I hate to say it, but it's, it's just a matter of time until there's a serious, serious accident. There was already one with Jalen Carter, but I think what would really scare the powers that be is that when it happens, when somebody innocent gets hurt, when it's somebody on your team that does something stupid, you can say, Oh yeah, young, we're going to handle the discipline, that sort of thing. If it's a mother of four that gets hit by one of your players because he's drag racing on the road, you got a major, major problem there. And I don't think the SEC has any idea how to deal with this because I don't think they've looked at it at all because they've got bigger fish to fry. This NIL fish is the biggest fish you could possibly imagine frying. But eventually it leads to this, and that is guys having cars that are way too powerful at their age. Sorry. Well, and I'll give you this with the SEC needing to step in. Maybe it's probable that they should because now you, as a coach, if you try to discipline yourself, you can just lose out on recruiting, which is totally ridiculous and puts one hand tied behind your back. And I want to make something clear on this. I'm not picking on Trevor Etienne himself because Trevor Etienne, it was a reckless driving charge. It was a DUI. His it, it Basically, his DUI charge is classified as less safe, meaning it's likely he didn't even have a BAC level of 0.08. It was probably less than that, but he was swerving a little bit. So they were, and they found alcohol in his system. So it was enough for them to say, you should probably be booked and charged. There are, le that's different from what Jalen Carter was doing. Is that fair to say? Yes. 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 Like, I don't, this I, is, I don't want to compare the two. Yeah. This is Trevor Etienne had maybe one more drink than he should have had before he drove home and he swerved a little bit. And that's not the same as getting drunk, drag racing, driving 100 miles an hour and killing somebody. It's just not. And we shouldn't treat all traffic crimes the same. But Georgia as a whole has a problem. And you, you, Tre Trevor Etienne could literally be the straw that break the camel's back because he's a straw on a mountain of like stones and rocks below him. Yep, absolutely. This Cam Sutton thing is absolutely bizarre we begin with cam sutton having an arrest warrant out for him the former tennessee quarterback wanted for domestic assault then suddenly they can't find him and then reports coming out that he had blacked out at the university of tennessee just walking down the road at times and that he had a long history of concussion like symptoms wow this does not make the powers that be which was butch jones at the time look very good caleb you provide me with some fodder here because i'm gonna go ahead and tell you 
that if the NCAA and what it once was is so upset about players getting paid or illegal recruiting visits, then what do you do to a guy like Butch Jones who put players on the field who were not ready to go back on the field? I remember that regime openly talking about how easy it was to be taught how to fake these tests. And a lot of players did. I just, it yeah. blows me away with all that we know now with head injuries that you would put a guy out there that has such serious issues as has been reported with Cam Sutton. But we all know Butch Jones is a sociopath, so maybe we shouldn't be shocked. Yeah, so let's let's uh, break this down real quick. Steeler, uh, and this is news of today. Steelers coach, according to the Detroit Free Press, Steelers coach Mike Tomlin said he reached out to Cam Sutton, who played for the Steelers before the Lions, in light of the off-field issues that Sutton's dealing with. Asked if he talked to Sutton, Tomlin said, quote, none of your business, which leaves me to believe that he Great reached out and can't leads me to believe Mike reached out and can't get a hold of him. The whereabouts of Cam Sutton. Well, no, no, no. I think no, I think that means he did talk to him. You think I he think did talk to him? Opposite. Yeah, if you say I don't know, because it's easier to say no. Couldn't get him. Well, maybe the whereabouts of Cam Sutton have been in question for five days now. People don't know where he is. And right. This is like, a this very, is, very scary situation that could end in a very, very bad way. Yes. And so we want to start with whoever was victimized by Cam Sutton's assault is the most important person to care about here that we, you know, your heart's always with the victim. Amen. But you, and I know you want to hold the person who does the assault accountable, but why don't we hold, if you're worried about victims, then you should be holding account conditions that lead to these assaults, i.e. not worrying about players heads when they're having head injuries and guys cam Sutton was a sophomore in 2013 2014 blacked out i think it was the missouri game he said he spoke and i i apologize up front i did not see the story when it came out i i don't know why it didn't trend more in 2014 i was covering college football back then i don't know why this didn't trend and why i didn't find it done but sutton said he would black out regularly yeah, well, walking, walking down the street and just kind of wake up. Uh, Elias said no bleeping way he legitimately cleared concussion protocols. It wouldn't surprise me if it comes up that he wasn't given one. If the NCAA wants to do something that really matters now, since they can't govern money and they can't govern transfers, this is it. Safety of the game, which ironically you pointed out to me is why they were originally developed. That's why it was that's why Teddy Roosevelt formed, formed the NCAA. To do that, you have nothing to do. Give yourself some usefulness. Maybe you'll keep a job. Go after Butch Jones, suspend him for a year if you find a history of this stuff. And to me, Cam Sutton saying what he said is almost almost enough proof i want a little bit more proof but travis you're right there's really no need for the ncaa arkansas state should fire him right now i mean if i'm one of the arkansas state players parents butch jones better pick up my phone call today right now the next five minutes i don't care if he's got 84 other scholarship players on his roster pick up my phone call or i got a problem Yes, so obviously this was Butch Jones' second year at Tennessee when he when the report came to Cam Sutton was reportedly blacking out when he walked down the street and was and, and, and there's two other things we have to get out with Butch Jones and this is why we're bringing Butch Jones into this guys we're bringing him into this because this is not Butch Jones' first dust up with allegedly forcing players to play when they had concussions who remembers the Brett Kendrick incident Brett Kendrick played the second half against Kentucky in 2017 with the concussion, according to a report from the read optional at that time. Now, how, how he got cleared by team Dockers, I don't know. But yes, he was cleared to play with the concussion in the second half. And the athletic director, director John Curry at the time came up with a statement that outlined concussion protocol, but he didn't say that protocol was or was not properly followed. Curry was about to fire Butch Jones anyway. This is November of 2017. Also, Chris Weathered, who was who unleashed and unloaded everything to know about Butch Jones on a Fox Sports Radio interview in 2020, basically said that um, 
there were notable times where Butch Jones oftentimes played favorites. And at one point, whether it had to need a time off because of a personal issue, Jones said he didn't believe him. And then another point he brought out where Jones tried to force him out when he was hurt. So how can you not get suspended for something like this? How can you get suspended for so many things and they can't call up old Butch and say, we've, we're going to investigate what went on there. This is an easy investigation too. Cause most people would talk. Yeah. You just, this is not a difficult, this is not a difficult investigation in which somebody's going to lose their eligibility and a coach could get fired because he gave money at the wrong time. This is an easy one. Everybody wants to talk. I could get this done by the end of the day. And so let's break down what we know about this with Butch Jones. Because we can't say for sure he cleared any concussion protocols. There's no direct thing on that. But let's say what we do know. We know that Butch Jones, we know that Brett Kendrick played the second half of a game under him with a concussion. We know that Chris Weathered is alleging a lot of player abuse under Butch Jones. Uh, from verbal abuse to saying he'll send you back to Dallas and stuff like that. We know that Cam Sutton said 10 years ago that he would have regular blackouts walking and... Dave has firsthand accounts more than I do. Oh, oh, and we know that Anton Davis resigned as the VFL coordinator because of verbal abuse from Butch Jones. It's true. And we know, and Dave can tell you more than I can because Dave has connections of Butch Jones blatantly verbally abusing players and maybe going beyond verbal abuse with a lot of his players. I don't, I don't know if I've told this story in the show before, but I'll tell it again because the show's grown so much. If I told it six months ago, we got like 15 times the listeners. So... But I'll tell this really quick. I mean, I had a player that called me and said, Dave, I just want to let you know that if my son gets charged with a felony, it's Butch Jones's fault, which seems like a really weird statement to make, right? So I said, I don't understand at all, Mr. And I'm not going to tell you who it is. But Butch Jones called this player, according to this player's dad, a GD woman's part word, okay? And this family was deeply religious. And just religious or not, the rule is you can say you're pl- you're acting like a jerk. You don't say you are a jerk. You don't call names. But religious or not, the family was very religious, and it was all this player could do not to knock Butch Jones out. Well, the dad wanted to call me. It was so serious. And just tell me that, hey, if you uh, hear of this happening, I want a backstory that you know why, because he's being abused, and I don't know that he's going to be able to contain himself. That's real stuff, man. That's, and I mean, you do not have to ask, or I didn't, he called me. I didn't call him. I didn't even know about this, Caleb, and you could have an investigation and wrap it up, NCAA, in two or three weeks, and then Butch Jones needs to be suspended for about a month or a year. Yeah, and there should have been, you're right. And honestly, I'm surprised looking back, we know more now. Should have been investigations when Cam Sutton said what he said 10 years ago. Should have been an investigation when Brett Kendrick came out and said he played with a concussion. But how, it's like, from where though, Caleb? Where does the investigation come from? The minute that news gets out, you can spark an investigation for any reason. But where, how does it Oh, that's get what I mean. Out? The NCAA should have done that 10 years ago. You're right. They should be in the business of investigating these things. The NFL investigates them. Okay, but here's how bad Butch Jones was. He ran two reporters that I respect very much off of the beat because he was so abusive to them. Who reports it? It was so tyrannical over there that reporters were afraid, players were afraid, everybody was afraid. I mean, it was that bad. So how does that story get out? Because you know if you report it, and something comes up where it's a gray area or Tennessee backs him instead of you, which goodness gracious, instead of the right, the correct way, the honest truth I've seen happen personally, then you're at a point where you don't really have any options. That was Butch Jones. That's the way he tried to throw around his power. Fortunately for those that are a part of Tennessee's athletic department, he wasn't a good football coach, so he wasn't around long. There's also, I don't know, I there's also the sexual assault lawsuit that happened while he was head coach against the university. I'm going to be fair. I'm staying off of that because A.J. Johnson was acquitted in about 45 minutes. And yep. the Knox County DA had no evidence to bring that charge. And whatever you think happened, there was no reason to stall a trial like that for four years. And by However, the way, and, and by the way, I think 99% of police are good people. I think there are 
bad people and everything. And I'm not saying they're bad people in this instance, but if there's ever a time to call out a police department, that would have been it. And Butch Jones didn't have the stones to do that. No, he didn't. That's true. You're right. And it's funny because he has law enforcement in his family. He he should have known that the law enforcement usually knows when there's more abuse of power. They know better than the actual citizens a lot of times. So, yeah, he should have known. But um, there's Smoky the, there's Mountain Red. Can I answer Smoky Mountain Red's question real quick? And I'll get right back to you. He said, serious question, not making fun. How can a person be scared of him? Because you didn't have NIL and you didn't have a transfer portal and he controlled your future. And it's it, you're right. And also, he was much more popular in 2014 than he was in 2016. It was easier. It, the thing with coaches is they have a lot of power when people still believe in them as far as winners. Don't they, Dave? They, that's where they have the most power. Yep, 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 yep. yep and yep. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's why it's always – it happens everywhere. You see the negative stories come out like – three years down the road, like when they're already on the hot seat. Now with Derek Dooley, you saw him immediately because people didn't like the Derek Dooley hire to begin with. I'm sure you remember that, but most of the time it's down the road guys. We, I, I reported on this then, and it was suspicious to me. Butch Jones didn't have a strength coach for a year. He didn't have a strength coach in 2016. That's bizarre. You, we talked about that at our 3:45 a.m. production meeting. He brought that up and I was like, that's, I'd forgotten all about that. Be sure you hit that like, and subscribe button. Before you get out, please subscribe. Do that. Cooper Mays coming up and a cast for football season that might just blow you away. For Caleb Calhoun, I'm Dave Hooker. This has been a presentation.